to feed. We thank you for those that make that emergency phone call at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. They answer their phone to just pray with somebody. We thank you for our chaplains that do stay in constant prayer. We thank you for our pastor, Father God. And Father, tonight we just ask you to just multiply this money so that we can take care of more people, Father. You know, there's a scripture that says that if we feed a stranger or another person or we give them water or we give them clothes, that we are doing it unto you. And the way ministry takes that to heart, Father. We give our best of our best, Father God. I have seen our people take off their socks and hand them to somebody, Father God. And we just thank you for those hearts. We just ask that we just get so much abundance and favor, Father, that there will be no lack in this ministry. I declare and decree joy and prosperity and abundance to this ministry tonight, Father God. And as we go into the year, new year, Father God, I just glorify you and I thank you for another year of the Way Ministries, Father God. And I just thank you for everything that your son has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You sure you just don't want to go ahead and preach? <laughs> I'll just sit here. <laughs> okay, real soon. All right. You know we're going to hear about identity if I preach. That's okay. I love identity. I love Jesus. Do we have any Jesus lovers in the house? You guys have been awful quiet tonight. I don't know. Or was it just me? Is my ears plugged up? They're quiet? The turkey does have that, whatever, trip, yeah, that, that amino acid that, like, you know, just knocks you down. It trips you up. <laughs> yeah. So is everybody okay, though? You're here. I mean, we got a lot of people out and, so, you know, doing the vacation thing and everything, but I'm glad you all showed up. I mean, I, I think the, that if a preacher has fear, it's a fear he's going to show up to church and not nobody going to be there. <laughs> Scary thought. But Man, Mark, you're like a new man. I, didn't, I had to take a double look at you. I got a, one question. Do you feel strong still? You got all your strength? Okay. All right, so if I cut my hair, I'm not going to go weak or anything. Yeah. <laughs> That's my brother. <laughs> not just anybody a fool, huh? <laughs> Lay heads. It helps them. Yeah. <laughs> They'll come to their senses and get out of the pig pen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'd be it. That's an eye opener right there, or maybe an eye closer. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move this. I can see. What is this? It's a Bible. Huh? It's what? It contains the Word. Yes. God's too big to fit in this book, but it has a lot of things that God said in it. And uh, it's... It's called the good book for a reason. Some of you might have heard me say this. They call it the good book because it's a pretty good book. And if you don't read it, you need to try to read it. Because the answers for your life is in here. Just every situation. It might not speak directly to something and you'll say, oh, that's not in there. But it's in there. you got to read between the lines because there's principles in this book. There's life in this book because it contains the story of salvation actually it's a continuation of a of a love romance that god has from the human race from the time that he created the universe till now and i don't know how long it took for man to finally appear here on earth and all the chaos that had to happen before that we could have a pretty good conversation not on a friday night but I could sit with some of you and we could have a good conversation and I could point out some things to you that 
you might religiously believe something, but I'm, I turn over your religious cart. There's things that we don't know yet, but it's kind of cool to ponder some things, you know, the mysteries of the universe and stuff like that. Uh, that one fellow, that black fellow, he, got, he said that he wanted to know the mysteries of the universe. As I talk about this, you might, I can't recall his name right now. And God says to him, why don't we start with the peanut? Well, that's where all this healing oil from peanuts came from and peanut butter. And God just started showing him the mysteries of the peanut. Oh, I think his last name was Washington. Carver. Car, yeah, that's it. Carver. Amazing. He wanted to know the mystery. And God says, well, let's just do the peanut and see what happens. There's so much to know in uh, in the mysteries of God. And there's things that God wants us to go after because if you don't pursue it, you can't know it. The, the number one, and I was going to talk on this tonight, but I want to throw it out there because in the future we will be discussing this at some depth. The number one thing that we can pursue in our lives is the presence of God. And... Uh, Especially like when we come into church and do the it 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 doesn't well I shouldn't say it doesn't matter but it helps to have a great worship team and good music and all that but really you could have a weak worship team and a bunch of enthusiastic people who are in pursuit of God you know that's why I don't it's not about hey this is a standard that I want my worship team to reach or anything else what I want is the people to come in here hungry for God and begin to pursue him because you will, with reckless abandon, ignore everything around you and just go after God. And if 10 people did that, it would change the atmosphere in the church immediately. If everybody came in here pursuing his presence and nothing else mattered, ooh-wee, Tammy would be happy. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy too. I might dance, you know. I like to dance. I didn't like to dance, but I danced for Jesus. And uh, and a lot of people don't want to do certain things because it's a sacrifice of the flesh. Well, we should l offer our bodies as living sacrifices. And that means stand to your feet when you don't feel like it. Maybe get down on your knees when you don't and bow and clap and raise your hands and just worship God at the top of your lungs and not worrying about what somebody's going to think. Just pursue him. And when you pursue him, it will attract him to you. And that's what happens. The pursuit of God is amazing. And I've heard a lot of people say, I would just like to see God, or I'd like to see angels, or I'd like to be touched by God. Well, the thing is, is that, is that your, does your life bear that out, and do you pursue him on a daily basis? There is a life, and I know this. I know this because I have done it. I don't maintain it. I must confess but there's a point that you can get in your spiritual walk that God directs your every step. And it's not a controlled life. It's a life of freedom. It's a life of peace. It's a life of power. It's a life of change. And all of a sudden, everything you do has purpose. And sometimes you don't understand it, but you know it was powerful. And sometimes you see clearly why you had to go somewhere at a certain time because God had set up a divine encounter. Can you imagine living your entire life under the influence of the Holy Spirit and bringing power wherever you went, change to people? And they, they might not even know God, but if they bump into you and you're living that life of pursuit after God, they're going to be changed because the presence of God is going to touch them. Do you know that the way that God created us, listen to this. This is an interesting thought here. Do you know the tangible universe, that which is created can't contain his presence. But the human being is created in such fashion that there is the center core of our being called the spirit of man. And once he begins to come into that and revive it and brings life. It enlarges and it gets bigger and gets bigger. And there is no boundaries there because the container of that is not your flesh. That's just, that's just the housing for your spirit. 
But when the spirit, I mean the soul, but when the spirit begins to enlarge, there is no boundaries because he will come in and come in and come in and come in. And his train fills the temple. Do you really want an encounter with God? Then you got to go after it with hunger. You got to hunger for him. You got to want him more than, than you want anything else. He's got to be number one. That's why Jesus said, you know, I've got to be before anybody in your life, including your family, including your parents, including your loved ones. I've got to be number one. Because if you don't make me number one and deny all else, you're not worthy of me. Straight up. And if you make him number one, the things that ha should have preeminence in your life and be first, he will make sure that happens in your life. Because some people has this order. You know, well, it, a smart person will say, well, I'm going to put God first, and then I put family, and then I put my job, and, and my country, or whatever. There's a whole list of stuff. You know what I say? God, 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 God. If you do that, your family's going to be taken care of. Your job's going to be fabulous. And this country would change if we had lovers of God everywhere. Pursuers of God, wherever we went. Somebody just say, pursuit. <laughs> We're going to start before the new year. We're just going to start pursuing God. Isn't it festive in here and it's nice and warm and you come in and it's all Christmassy and bright? Huh? Should I do something Christmassy? I don't know. This is something I had for the program. And I haven't, I don't think I've done it actually like this before. But do you know when you, when you have a child, or even a grandchild, or a family member has a child, everybody gets, woohoo, you get the phone call, or you rush down to the hospital, you go see the new baby, and you're all, you know, excited and everything. When God sent his son to the planet, he was excited. You could just see him, like, looking over, you know, the banisters of heaven and saying, that's my boy. He's in my image. That's him. That's the one. He goes, what are you angels doing standing around? Now? Get down there and start singing. <laughs> Make the announcement. <laughs> Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. I just love Christmas. This is a good time of the year. So, uh, I, okay, so... Okay, what I did to you last week, um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, dear. <laughs> I think you just like me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that tonight because that's the first time I lied in a long time. I'm just, I got away with it, though. I mean, it was so good. But I felt like, you know, the, how the hourglass and it gets down to the last little granules of sand, but each of those granules of sand are like nuggets. And it seemed like we just, like, Went too fast. Uh, can I remind you of some things that I spoke on last week? Uh, I think I started out with uh, talking about a spiritual kingdom in a natural world, didn't I? Something like that. And uh, didn't I ask you all, why would God make promises? And we got to, God wants us to expect and anticipate. He, he wants us to stand in hope. I knew I was going to do that. Um, because... <clears throat> Faith is an anticipation or an expectation of what God has said that he's going to do. And when we stand in that hope, things are going to happen. So I just wanted to kind of bring up, you know, those things. Because I, w I really wanted to talk about last Friday was the fact of what the promise is. And, I, and I've said it numerous times because... The fulfillment of the promise is receiving Jesus because he, is, he brought all the promise of God and made it available to all of us. That's why we as believers should not lack any good thing because he is the fulfillment of the promise. And when we receive Jesus, it's just we, what we do is we'll get enough to be comfortable, I think, in our lives, and then the pursuit ends there, and then we just kind of like stay in the little, okay, this is comfortable, you know. So I've stretched. It was hard going through some of that stuff. Listen, that should never end. It should always be a, a, a groin and a training because if you quit
growing and you quit training and you quit living and you, you quit experiencing new experiences, then you're on your way out. I mean, really, what is the limit right now? If we were filled with the Holy Spirit of God and walked in victory and power and health, how long could we live in this old body? I mean, there's a few things I need to fix right now. But I think people start thinking, thinking like this, mm, it's hard to do anything. Man, there's a lot of pain involved in this. And some people start looking like, well, I don't want to live past 75 or 80, you know, because it's just hard to get out of bed anymore. You notice that uh, my shoes don't have shoe strings on them. It's easier just to slip them on, you know, and where I, I can get that boot right there, you know, so, you know, it's a little easier. You know, that's something I never thought about when I was young. You know, bend over and bend over twice. <laughs> but when you get a little age on you, whoo. And God, he wants a church that's ageless. He said so. He said, I want to come for a church that's without spot or wrinkle. That's a church that's got it, baby, because we're walking in the life he's given us, and we're thriving, not just maintaining, not just holding the for it until Jesus gets here. Man, if we don't understand the reality of Jesus in us, then we're this life is already lost. Then we'll just maintain until the eternals and, you know. But that's not what God designed for us, given us the promise. He wants us to live the fullness of the promises in the here and now, and 99% of everything that Jesus did on Calvary and all that he did in his suffering and everything that he took upon himself was for this lifetime now, 99% of it. And then eternal life in the hereafter. But the thing is, we don't need the stripes of Jesus in the hereafter. See, that's for the here and now. So healing is for here and now. To walk in victory is for the here and now. All the the... the, the the mental anguish and the suffering and the torn up emotions and the bondage that we live in. All that Jesus suffered was to break all those curses so that we might live in victory and live in power now. And when we hear that word salvation, it's not just eternally with Jesus. It starts now. Salvation starts at the moment that we receive Him into our heart. When He moves in, He brings all of His delivering power and all of his love and all of his peace and all of his joy and all of his righteousness right now so the kingdom of God can be exhibited in us and through us because the world needs his presence. We are the carriers of God. We are viceroys in the region. What's another word? When they send out a, a, ambassadors. No matter what country we go to, if we, we are sent by that country, then we are ambassadors in that country. And as, as, uh, as Americans, if we go to a, 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 another country somewhere else and we're sent for, on behalf of the United States, we are ambassadors for the United States. And where we go, our country goes with us. In other words, we represent the United States. Well, you know what? We're sent here now as ambassadors for the kingdom of God. Therefore, everywhere we go, we establish the kingdom of God. We bring forth God and his kingdom. And his kingdom simply means that it is the presence of God here because it is the king's domain. And where his domain is, he has rule in that area. That's why it's so important to understand that the king is in this house and his dominion is there. In other words, it's his rule because he's the boss. He's the king. He's Lord. Everybody says Lord means boss. All right, and so if he's your Lord, you need to listen to what he says to you and do what he says to you. I mean, he got his disciples on that one. He just looked at him and says, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I tell you? Ooh, that's got to hurt, especially later. Then they had to write about it and admit. Think about it. There's a lot of crazy stuff in the Bible like that, you know. You think about Moses, the first five books of the Moses of, of, of the book, Bible is written by Moses. First five books. But yet written in the first five books of Moses is, Moses was the most humblest 
man on the planet. He wrote that about himself. That's a different kind of humility, but I guess God told him to write it. So <laughs> I got I to gotta stay right there. Because talking about, you know, uh, the book of Moses and the pursuit of God. Because remember what Moses said to God. He said, God, I want to look upon you. I want to see you. God says, you can't see me and live. In other words, your flesh can't handle it. And did that stop Moses? He pursued God. He said, God, I want to look on you. I want to see you. And so finally God says, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to put you here in this, in this cleft right here of, of stone, and I'm going to cover you with my hand, and then I'm going to go by. And I'm going to let you see my hinder parts. Now, let me clarify that. It doesn't mean... Yeah, that he was going to look at, you know, God's bottom and his rear and all that. Because, you see, wherever God goes, there's an anointing. And it re leaves a residual. And so that goes all the way back from the finite, the beginning of the finite construct of the entire universe. And from that time, there's a pattern. There is a residue left. There is an anointing left wherever God is went so he showed moses his glory he said i'm going to show you my glory remember what he said couldn't see him face to face but he said i'm going to show you my glory so he covers moses's face with his hand and he passes by and moses was able to look that everything that god had done and so when it was time for him to take pin in hand he said in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and the earth was void without form and darkness was upon the face of the deep oh my goodness because he had looked upon god's hinder parts and then he took pen in hand and began to write the holy scripture seeing the things that God had done, seeing the manifestation of God's glory, and was able to talk about it and do it. Oh, man, man, man. Do you really want to see God? It's going to change your life. All preconceived ideas has got to go. I'm telling you. And other people, just because of the experience Moses had, he came down, they were all scared. They were shaken. They didn't want to see God. They didn't want to talk to God. They said to Moses, you talk to him for us. They couldn't even look at Moses because Moses got too close to God. So they covered him up with a veil. That's why the old covenant was covered in a veil. But in Christ, the veil is removed. And we can see clearly. Listen, he steps into the mountain, up, up on that mountain into a cloud. A few thousand years later, he steps out of the cloud. Moses and Elijah, remember, on the Mount of Transfiguration? And who's he looking at? He's looking at the transfigured Christ. He's looking at God in his face. Oh, if that don't get you excited, I could preach till the cows come home and leave again, and you ain't, ain't going to do it for you. Was that good? Because you see, you need the revelation or you need the understanding. And simple words can't do it. But it's the pursuit of Him that's going to give it to you. It's a pursuit of Him that will give you spiritual understanding of anything this mind can figure out. Because it's not figured out by man's mind. It's impossible to figure out. These things have got to be received by the Spirit of man. And when the Spirit of God calls the deep to deep, then it changes your insides. And you begin to understand the things that man could not understand with his mind, but with his spirit he can receive them. Because these things are only understood by spirit. Spirit speaks to spirit. Deep talks to deep. So if you're hearing this in the spirit, then your spirit is revived. And if you're receiving it, there's no end to it. 
And you can begin to hear and under. See, this takes away the fear. This takes away the pain. This takes away even of loss. And we all suffer loss. And sometimes it's almost so unbearable. And especially when it keeps reoccurring. But when we begin to come into Him, we begin to know that nothing is lost. That's, that's great comfort and peace. Because that pain of death is removed in Christ Jesus. Oh, kids, what He's done for us is so glorious. And if you don't understand this, draw closer to Him. And He'll begin to give you the comfort and the peace. And take away all that. And you don't ever forget. It's not that you forget. But the pain is taken away. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Because it's swallowed up in Christ Jesus. And he leads us on in triumph. Whew. All right. That was way from where I was going to be. Was that pretty good? But I'm still talking about this salvation. I want you all to understand this salvation. And this salvation is just not for, oh, someday when you die and go to heaven. That's stupid. I mean, for believers to say that when I die and go to heaven, because Jesus said, he who believes in me shall never die. That doesn't mean that your physical body is just going to live on and live on. It's got to be regenerated. You're going to receive a new body. Okay, bottom line. But the thing is... If you depart from this body, if and when you do, you are not ever separated from him. Because the, the, the only thing that really means death spiritually is being separated from God. And Jesus fixed that. So those of us who believe will never be separated from his presence. We're not, we don't have to go now into that other compartment in hell where you can look over and see the torment and the suffering. Because now... If we step out of this life, we just step into the presence of God. That's why the Apostle Paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That's glorious. That's glorious. You think about our loved ones has gone over. They are that Now they are that cloud of witnesses that has joined all those people of faith in the Old Testament too. And, and, and the cloud of witnesses, it's, it gives it this. In, I think it's the Message Bible that talks about it this way. It's like a bunch of grandstands, and they're watching all the people go on on earth, and they're going, do it, go, 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 because we're in the same race they was in. And we're running some of the last laps. And, and, and they need us. They need us to run fast and run hard and do the right things that we need to do because they're counting on us because we're all going to receive the promise together. You understand? They're waiting to receive the promise too. Okay, now I just really went ballistic. <laughs> I want you to know your salvation. That it pertains to the here and now and for eternity. But we need to walk in victory in the here and now. Can I read you some scriptures pertaining to this? And how we struggle at these silly little things that crop up in our way and we trip over them. And, oh, I'm so devastated. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't pay this stupid bill. Really? Really, get your eyes on him. Get your eyes on Jesus. He'll empower you. He'll give you the knowledge to create wealth. If that's what you're struggling with, I'd like to talk to some of you about that. Let's create some wealth together. <laughs> Isn't it? Wouldn't it just be nice to get so close to Jesus, you are the answer to their prayers when they meet you? Because you just know him and you'll just bring him right in. He'll sit right down on the couch. They can't see him, but you know he's there because you brought him in. And then you just release him. Get him, Jesus. Oh, my God, he's wonderful. He's good. He's amazing. And you know the amazing thing he did is all the things that I thought were so important that were silly... He changed my understanding of what the real world was. Real, it's like Matrix. And all of a sudden, that's a fraud. It's not even real. And I was spending my life. I was giving my life away to something that will never amount to anything. Listen, if we're going to spend our life, let's spend it on that which is going to give it back to us eternally. Let's give it to Jesus. So you better make sure it's the right Jesus that stands up. Not some religious Jesus. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. 
There is nobody like him. He's the river of living water. He is the tree of righteousness. He is the door to life. He is the one and the only. There is none like him. No, not one like him. He is it, baby. Oh, there's a bunch more names, but anyway. Somebody shout one at me. That was really enthusiastic. <laughs> at least you gave it a shot. That was, that was good. Emmanuel, God with us. Jehovah Jireh, God the provider. Oh, there's so many of them. He, it, it, Jehovah Nisi, my righteousness. He is, he is my shield. He is my strength. He is my song. Woo, woo. He's the bread of life that came down from heaven. Oh, man. Oh, just have a drink of him. You know, the Bible says that if you drink of him, you'll never thirst again. So whatever you're drinking of, if you're thirsty all the time spiritually, you're not drinking the right drink. You better look in the cup and make sure you've not been tricked. If there's cinnamon and, and a bunch of herbs and stuff floating in the communion cup, you got the wrong cup. They've tricked you. <laughs> they made it look good. And you're drinking the wrong communion cup, believe me. I got that one in a dream. It was pretty incredible. I love dreams. Did I tell you I love dreams? Can I read something to you about the salvation of your soul? So if, so if, if, if he brings us all into the promise to get us somewhere, where is he taking us? Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 9, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So if the end of your faith brings you to the salvation of your souls, your souls, it's not the end, it's the beginning. But the end, the point of your faith is you, to bring you to the promise, which is Jesus, which is the fulfillment of the promise, which gives you salvation, which gives you life. Sozo, in the here and now and eternally. It starts when you receive him. Of this salvation, let's talk about it for a minute. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. In other words... The Holy Spirit was revealing to them that this was coming. And so they were diligent. They talked about it. They prayed about it. They had visions of it. They wrote about it. They looked into it. When they got together, they talked about this great salvation that was going to come. And some of them heard and knew that they wasn't going to see it in their day, but they were still going to receive it when it came on planet Earth. In other words, they would enter into death, but it was okay because it was promised to them also, but they were looking at a time that was before them, I mean, in, out in their future, and so they were diligent to find out all they could because they, like natural people, are curious about stuff, and they wanted to see the, the spiritual promise and know about it. Does that make sense to you all? Now, I'll never finish this one if I don't, but I've got to do that. You know i got to do that. So they have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Woo! I love grace. I wouldn't be here without grace. I would be gone off the planet because of the way I lived. I would be dead. I don't even know if I would have been born. But grace brought me here, and grace keeps me in place because of the love of my Father he gave me things I didn't deserve. And he withheld the things that I deserve. That's grace, baby. All right? And this is what they did. Searching what or what manner of time. In other words, when it's going to be. When it's going to happen. And we got, we, got, we got Christians, whole sects of Christians who do this now with other stuff. When's the end coming? When's the end coming? Listen, they got Jesus. What in the world are you worried about? The greatest thing that could ever happen happened 2,000 years ago when I was just telling you when God sent his angels down to sing peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Something happened that day because the Christ child came to planet earth in the flesh. God in flesh. There's your Emmanuel. Am I getting too loud for you? You okay? All right. What manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of the Christ and the glories that would follow. In other words, the manifestations of God that would flood the planet. Is this Christmas or what? To them it was revealed that 
not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you. And you understand, the, the reported to you was 2,000 years ago. You understand that after his, after his birth and his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what he's talking about, the fulfillment of all that promise that we now have received the fullness. And, and through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things, listen to this, that angels desired to look into. And so for you human beings that you're curious about the heavenlies and you want to see angels and stuff, do you know what's more exciting? What we have. Because angels for eons wanted to know and see what we're experiencing here on planet Earth. Or at least what we should be experiencing. Angels are on assignment waiting to be discharged and come to this planet to watch over us when we walk in the obedience of God. I've had numerous ones with me at times. I had... Three, that when I would go into San Francisco every day and hit the Bay Bridge, they would be waiting there and come down and follow me into the city for the task that I had to do. I know that just stretched some of you. I don't care. It's my reality. Do I have a scripture that says exactly that? No. But it happened. Okay. You have angels watching over you. Just like Jesus had a whole bunch. He had a whole bunch. He had like 10,000. Yeah, watching over him. And even Satan knew that because he quoted the scripture to him. He said, you know, throw yourself down because if you dash your foot against the stone, the scripture says the angels will bear you up. See, the enemy even knew the scripture. Jesus wasn't going for any of that. Things, and I'm going to say it again to you. Listen, we're talking about this salvation, how glorious and how great it is. It's 8 o'clock right now, all right? Uh, no, I, I, I got a thing going on, okay? So you got to keep my word, my word. Things which angels desired, things which angels desired to look into. You have experienced the things that would get heaven's attention. And do you know that even now, when we bring one in that doesn't know, and they come to know Jesus, the Jesus that I'm preaching about, and they receive salvation, the angels explode. And in the corridors of heaven, every salvation. So they're erupting all the time because there are more people getting saved on the planet now than ever in the history of the earth. So they're continually I can just see God has like a, a thousands of them over here. And every time somebody gets saved, whoa, whoa, man, you, and you see wings flapping. Oh, they have wings. There are angels that have, there are some angels that have six wings. Some angels are enormous. You guys want to hear about this or not? Are you interested? Uh, they're enormous. Angels are like trippy. Their wings are like so big. The ones that I saw, the first ones I saw, the span of their wings. I mean, I thought they were like, like you know, big angels maybe with long wings. When they touched from tip to tip, it was like a span that was like as wide as this church, these angels. And what ran, run, what rode down through the middle of them was Jesus on a white horse. And he was riding right at me. And I thought he was just going to ride by because I didn't know who it was until he got about halfway. And then I saw his hair and his eyes, and, and he glowed like his skin just glistened. And I thought he was going to ride by me. And he looked at me, and he said, you will fulfill the call on your life. Have no fear. And he just rode on by. And, oh, that was one of those going over the Bay Bridge, and I was driving the big Cosmo truck. And there I was, like, angels do have wings, you know, going through that whole thing. Wow, so many believers are going to be blown away when they really see that they're, because they just don't believe. And I guess I didn't really either, and then I saw them. And then I came out of this vision, 
And I'm like ready to turn over the Bay Bridge and down into San Francisco and needed to turn to go in, you know, down into the United Nations Plaza. I don't remember a thing. Oh. Talk about dimensions. Anyway, I, I, I don't know why I shared that. You guys like me to share stuff like that? Angels, good. Angels, because I, I, it feels good telling it. You know, I, I didn't tell anybody for a long, long time. I was like freaked out about it. Um, the things which angels desire to look into, therefore, here's that hammer, here's that scripture, therefore gird up your loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that it is that brought you to, brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did I say earlier that you need to have the revelation of Jesus Christ? Do you know what the revelation of Jesus Christ is? What revelation means? Revelation doesn't mean end of the world. It doesn't mean demons and goblins and, and big nasty monsters coming up out of the ocean. That's all symbolic. You understand? The revelation of Jesus Christ, Christ means his revealing. Him being uncovered and the manifestation of who he is to be shown to the world. That's what it means. And when you receive the revelation of Jesus Christ, it is the beginning of a revelation that will begin to grow in you and be manifested in you to bring you to your fullness, your manifestation that God has designed for you. And that's only possible through the revelation of Jesus Christ. No other way. There's no other way that man might come into this kingdom. There's no other way that man might be saved. The only way to receive salvation is at the revealing of Jesus Christ. And you don't have to know a lot. You just need to know that with your will by saying, I'm going to get to that because I've talked, I talked last week about the power of our we, uh, words. This is what brings us to salvation. So if I move on today, we can actually get there. I'm going to finish what Peter had started here as obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lust or in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. So in other words, you just can't get saved and run around and live like you did before. Because where is the proof that God is in your house? If you continue to live as you did before, there's going to be a definite change. And this is not a work mentality of all these things by law that you have to do. It's the grace of God because he brings the life and the power of God in you to do these things. But it's up to you to choose how far you're willing to go. Do you just want to be saved, saved, or you want to be saved, saved? I mean, saved is saved. Eternally, when Jesus comes in, you're saved. Because his, the power of his sacrifice and of his blood is that powerful. But do you just want to live a mediocre life? Or do you want to live a full life? And just affect people without them even knowing what you're about. You don't have to, with words, but with your conduct, what Peter was saying right here, live that life. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. In other words, be like Dad. Do you know what pleases him? When we begin to do the things that he does, when he talks like he talks, when, he, when we act like he acts, you know, most of you that have children, when they begin to do that, you were like, oh, look at them, they're just like me. And then they really do something like you, and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, <laughs> with God, there's, that, there's not that <clears throat> shock, oh, my God. Because he's like pleasantly pleased when you begin to walk in the miraculous. When you begin to speak that which is impossible and believe in it, and it begins to happen. That's well pleasing to God. To believe everything that Jesus has done for you and then receive it gladly. That is a miracle. That's amazing. And then to love the unlovable. And forgive those who sometimes at first you feel like are unforgivable. Do you ever... Stop to consider you might be the hopeless, unforgivable person. And it's God's grace that covers you and brings you into the mercies of God. Listen, I know. And, Danny, you heard the stories about me and your cousin. We were unforgivable, so it's the stuff we did. <laughs> but you know what? God's a loving God. 
and we're his children. And that's why he has made it possible for us to come in and be redeemed, be changed, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That which, which Rhonda was talking about early, that, that brings us into the identity of a true son or daughter of a living God. Okay, I'm going to go to part two real quick. Oh, the first thing that I, I had a question, uh, why would a king leave his throne? That song, This is Amazing Grace, that Bethel song, that is an amazing song. Because it asks the question, why would a king leave his throne? Why would he step down? Why would he leave it all behind? Well, listen to this. I'm going to read to you out of Hebrews chapter 2. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Even though we was deserving of death, God said, no, i got a better plan. I don't want you all to suffer that. You're my kids, so I'm going to send one kid. And this kid, he is the most obedient I've ever had. And he's going to be begotten. In other words, birthed in human flesh. He, who all the world was made through because he's the word of God, is going to come and be partaker of flesh and bone and blood just like you. So he can know what it's like to go through the temptation, to go through the tests, to go through the pain. And because his blood will be of me. You see, it was seed of the word that created him in the womb of Mary. And Mary said, so be it unto me according to your word. The angel brought the word. The word was the word of God. The the angel is a messenger of God. She received the word of God and it became flesh in her because that had a designed purpose this just don't happen all the time that was a designed seed to bring forth the word in flesh in mary a virgin birth and you see therefore there was nobody else no 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 no, nobody like jesus because that's he brought forth a blood that is was not from blood of adam but from egg of woman this is cool man you think about this and then he was born what we celebrate now on christmas Anybody just like celebrating the baby Jesus? Okay. Just sure. <laughs> but he was done, that was done so that he might go through all the suffering, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom all things in bringing many sons, and what, what that means, that means children of God, uh, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. But wait a minute, he was already perfect. But no, he was in the flesh, and he had to prove his loyalty and his obedience through suffering, that his sacrifice might be a worthy sacrifice acceptable by God, and not just for a few. Not just for a few. I'm going to read it here in a minute. Not just for a few. And both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not ashamed to call you family. Saying, I will declare your name to my brother. In other words, he will announce what God's name is to them. He will bring the testimony of God. In the midst of the assembly, and I will sing praises to you. Can you imagine Jesus praising? He's a praiser. He's a preacher. There's nobody preaching like Jesus. He brought, he's the original bringer of the good news. And we're just all knockoffs after him. <laughs> but we still got beautiful feet. If we bring the good news. And I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. See, they said, well, he, was, he didn't have any children. He who was, who was barren has more children than they all. Hmm. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. That's a great assembly right now. Because it isn't confined to one tribe in one country. It's the kingdom of heaven, baby. Okay, here we go. Let's jump into the word that speaks, that brings us forth, all right? But what does, Romans 10, 8 says, but what does it say then? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. We're talking about eternal salvation through a speaking the word. 
So if we speak the word of truth, who's that in our mouth? The word of God on our tongue, Jesus in our mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and when with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, if you had a speech impediment and couldn't talk, all you got to do is think it real hard. Just believe in your heart. You know what I'm saying. But it's powerful to say it. I'm, look at Jesus is my Savior. And he's my Lord, too. But Jesus is my Savior. He's my Savior. I am eternally grateful. God sent him just for me because I needed a Savior. And he saved me. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. You need to know you're saved. And for the here and now, not just for eternity, but for the here and now, let it just change your life. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For the scripture says, this, this is scripture quoting scripture, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame for there is no, oh, I could put it in there twice? Yeah, I did. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Here it comes. This is what you wanted to shout out, Lynn. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever. Does that, is that, that's new, that's new version. So it's not a whosoever. It's probably whoever. Is that a whoever? Whoever. Are you a whoever? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called on his name? Has everybody in here called on his name? Does somebody need to call on his name tonight? Because we'll help you. We like it. I like to do it over and over again. Every time I do it, I feel like I get saved all over again. It feels good. Not that I need to. Maybe at first I did. I don't know. Well, I was sitting under them terrorist preachers, though. By the time they got done preaching about sin, I, I knew I was guilty of one of those things. I better go to the altar call again. Oh, I'm there! I hit the wall! Okay, two scriptures, all right? Okay, I was just trying to make sure everybody's saved. This is important. <laughs> I'm going to give you a hope scripture. Remember, it's the hope that brings forth faith, and I covered that last week. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You see? So then faith comes by hearing, and 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 that hearing by the Word of God, which materializes into your salvation, because now faith has got a hold of it, it brought it forth, and it's manifested in your life. So that is the whole scripture, my friends, bringing forth faith. And you got to, got to, got to, got to hear the Word of God. All right? Is that simple enough for you? One more. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises. Remember, we started last week with promises. Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Each and every one of us, it's your responsibility. It's not my responsibility. It's my responsibility to preach, tell you, maybe even kick you sometimes or get kicked by, I don't know. I've been kicked, too. Uh, but to bring the truth, but it is your responsibility to search out your salvation in fear and trembling before God. And what that means, it's not, I'm not, like, not, not like the old covenant people that told Moses, you talk to him, God, we don't even want to look. We don't even want to see. We don't even want to go close to the mountain. But it's a fear of awe and respect because the more you look upon him, the more enlarged he'll become. He's magnified as we look upon him because he's, he's ginormous. And he's all-powerful, and he's all-knowing, and he's all-seeing. He's all that. And as we look, we're in awe and respect. And at first, it's just like, I'm amazed he even cares about me. What is man that you are mindful of us? But he is. And it's all about love. And he's redeemed us by his son. Amen? Amen. Stay festive and merry. Just tell somebody, Merry Christmas! <laughs> Bless you all. Come and have communion tonight. God bless.